Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, a three-time award-winning show that aims to motivate and inspire you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media, especially in relation to adventure and physical challenges. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. If you're passionate about adventure, challenge and learning from women who have overcome obstacles and achieved remarkable things, then this is the podcast for you. Every Tuesday at 7am, new episodes go live featuring incredible women who share their stories, insights and tips to help you achieve your dreams and goals. You can support the Tough Girl mission by signing up as a patron. Visit patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash tough girl podcast. Keep listening until the very end as I share more information about what's going on with me with Tough Girl Challenges, give shout outs and recommend other Tough Girl podcast episodes. More information can be found at toughgirlchallenges.com. So I'm Sarah Crossland. I live in Ellesmere Port in Cheshire. I'm an author, speaker, I love endurance events and I've recently created the Beyond Recovery Project off the back of having suffered a brain tumour myself. And this is not the first time that Sarah has been on the Tough Girl podcast. You came and spoke with us on the 15th of March 2022 where you shared more about overcoming fear and achieving your potential and you also shared more during that episode about your dreams and plans of wanting to run from Land's End to John O'Groats, a distance of 855 miles, which you wanted to do in 20 days, which was planned for September 2022. So during that episode, you know, we found out more about your early years, growing up, being diagnosed. Get uh, You talked more about getting into running, how running helped you, why you decided to push yourself. You shared more about some of the complications that you deal with that you dealt with, signing up for your ultra marathon, training for your first ultra. There's a lot of information that we go into in our first episode. So if you haven't listened to that episode, please do go back and give it a listen. But we're going to be picking up basically from September or just before September 2022 with the planning and preparation for Land's End to John O'Groats. So take us back to, to sort of August time when the preparation was coming to to the to the start line of taking on this epic challenge of Land's End to John O'Groats. You know, what were you doing? How were you feeling? What was going on? Everything was going on. I had the logistics of everything planned out that took forever. I planned the entire route from Land's End up to John O'Groats over 20 days. So we were averaging around, I think it was between sort of 37 on a short day and 45 on a long day miles. It was tedious. I spent an awful lot of time on Google Street View. We'd arranged as a team that I would meet up with the support crew every five miles, which it's great in theory, but realistically, is there always somewhere to pull over in a, a camper van every five miles? So I, I would plan a route and then I would have to go obviously onto Google Street View, find out where, you know, what the area was like, what spaces there were to park. Also, things like where the team were able to pick up a coffee or go and get food in and things like that along the route. Because I wanted it to be as easy for them as possible. I already felt bad enough that I'd put people out by having to take like two weeks out of their life to come and and support me. So, you know, I just wanted it to be easy and fun for them. So yeah, there's a lot of hard work went into the logistics of it all. Going to the start in September was rather nerve wracking. You know, as we drove down to Cornwall and you look at the A30 and it's just like roly poly hills, you know, up and down all the way to Land's End. We had a great place to stay the night before, which was good. And we set off to Land's End about seven in the morning, I think, with a planned eight o'clock start. Now, going back just a bit prior to this, it was meant to be a world record attempt. And again, it seemed like all throughout this, there were little obstacles cropping up. And I knew I'd never get the fastest female, but I wanted to highlight some of the issues that I'd faced along the way with the impact from my brain tumour diagnosis, the haemorrhage that I had and the surgery. And yet the Guinness World Records didn't have a category for things like chronic fatigue or balance issues. I was sent a list of categories to choose from and they were all things like limb amputations, you know, mobility issues, actual physical disabilities. And when I questioned them and asked, you know, but I've got a severed hearing nerve, that's not going to grow back in a similar way to someone's limb is not going to grow back. 
they couldn't really address that. And so I had to settle for a category of single-sided hearing loss, which is a bit annoying really, because, you know, in theory, I could have gone out, hit that record and a week later, somebody else with single-sided hearing loss without all of those issues that I'm also dealing with could have gone out and probably done it a lot quicker than me. But I took it as a win because, you know, I kind of made them have to have that conversation. And yeah, so I got to the start line. We had all the the paperwork for that was quite intense as well because we had to have witnesses for every day. I had to provide a copy of the route beforehand. But all of that was in place. And so just getting to the start line was a bit of a relief, to be fair. Once I got there and started running, it was just a few minutes just to settle into it. And it was a bit of a wow, this is actually happening now. And yeah, the the first day went incredibly well. But as you know, beyond that, it kind of went a little bit pear-shaped. So before we get into that, just quickly, how did your training go? Like, how were you physically and mentally getting yourself prepared to take on this challenge? You know, were you doing this all by yourself? Were you working with a coach? What did that look like? I was really fortunate a couple of years back to find John Fern who's an endurance coach he works a lot of quite high profile endurance athletes and I kind of thought I'd wreck his credibility a little bit if he took me on but he was he was quite happy to so yeah that's been a game changer for me actually having somebody who knows what they're doing and not just focusing on the running aspect of it either because there was so much more to do in an event like this and getting up and running every day I must say John is really good at addressing the psychological side of things as well. In terms of physical training, I was doing sort of long runs, back-to-back runs right up until about three weeks before. And then I had like a three-week taper, which is great actually. Yeah, so we we did all the usual, you know, because I think if you've got a good base level of training and I try to sort of maintain that, you know, throughout the year and then just sort of build up if I've got an event that I'm taking part in. Yeah, so I think we focused probably for about six months on working towards the daily mileage that I'd be doing from Land's End to John O'Groats. We had a few quite intense weeks where I was building up that long run and then we would also have back-to-back runs. So I'd do a run late in the evening sort of to replicate what a typical day would be like. So I would run late in the evening, go through the whole sort of nighttime routine. So I'd treat my house like the camper van in effect so I'd get back home go through the whole preparing food getting showered getting kit ready doing stretches go to bed wake up do it all again um, just to psychologically get my head in, in that space that it needed to be in which was really helpful because I think very often when we come across something that's not happened to be to us before during an event you know it kind of throws us off a little bit but when you've gone through every possibility in training when these issues arise you know you're prepared for it prior to the 2022 attempt we had a really hot summer so we even hired the camper van that I'd be using and went away for a weekend and did exactly the same so we'd go through the whole routine of preparing kit, preparing food, getting out and running, running late in the day, getting back, trying to sleep as best you can when it's not your own bed, then getting up in the morning, doing it all again. And one thing in particular that was highlighted when I was doing it one particular weekend, which was incredibly hot, was I suffered quite a lot of swelling. And I still don't know what actually causes that, but, you know, my feet swell, even my face looked quite swollen. So it's obviously like some circulatory thing or some salt issue that's going on. But I was prepared for that. So it wasn't a surprise to me when things like that started to happen. And again, it it comes back to that preparation. I think the event is just one aspect of, of doing something like this. You know, the biggest part of it is everything that leads up to it you know whether it's nutrition whether it's training whether it's getting your mind in the right place did you feel ready you know when you were stood on that start line just before eight o'clock what was going through your head I was absolutely ready I just wanted to get started because it has just consumed so much of my life you sacrifice a lot when you're doing things like this and it's it's a balancing act trying to keep you know your family happy and work and train and you know just look after yourself in general because it's easy to lose the plot at times it's quite stressful 
and I was just so glad to get there. It was almost like a release as soon as I hit that start button on my watch. Yeah, I was just glad to hit the road and, and just put one foot in front of the other. Tell us about the first day. How did it go? What was it like? The first day was really quite good, actually. We had good weather initially. A bit of sea fog, I think, rolled in at some point. I started off, it was clear blue sky, lovely sunrise, really good conditions, actually, light breeze. And it went really well. I remember thinking, you know, I'd hit like a marathon and I was thinking, wow, I've just done a marathon and this is going really well. And then around midday, the storm clouds gathered and we just had the most horrendous downpour. I think John had come out to cycle part of it with me at that point and probably regretted that decision. As we were going along the A30, it was just absolutely torrential rain, strong winds, thunderstorms. In addition to the rain, you've then got the spray from the lorries and the cars that are going past. And the actual side of the road, you like the little drainage channels you get at the side of the road, which is probably where I was running, became flooded. So my feet were absolutely drenched and, you know, wet feet go bad very quickly. I remember we got to the, the van for like one of our pit stops. I changed my socks, changed my shoes, got back on the road and literally within five minutes, my feet were just drenched again. So I was really unfortunate that we'd had all this brilliant weather if anything, a bit too hot during training. And we'd gone from that to, I think there were about two or three storm fronts passed through Cornwall over about a four-day period. So, yeah, it was really, um, really unlucky. How did that affect you sort of mentally and, and physically? Because, like, A, running along the side of a road with the lorries and the car spray, but also you know with with your hearing with balance having like wet feet all the time is just I was gonna say it's just not nice <laughs> <laughs> so as an impact from my brain tumor I've got single-sided deafness so I've got no hearing at all on my left side I have 50 percent balance function I still suffer with with balance issues with a bit of dizziness and nausea and incredibly loud tinnitus as well amongst other things. So I was concerned about how how these would impact me as I as I took this on but it's one of those isn't it you never know until you're actually doing it. At the start when we left Land's End it was a, quite a narrow sort of lane that you run along and then gradually as you sort of run out away from Land's End that becomes a bigger road and then it's quite a major a dual carriageway along the country so it, it was a bit of a gradual adjustment to it which was quite good in some respects because everyone says to me well how did you cope with that and I, I think you just kind of learn to shut off from it and I again it comes back to the training I was doing because I was given mindful runs to do and, and they are where you will go out and say do an hour-long session at a very easy pace, like zone two run. And for sort of 10, 15 minutes in that run, you focus purely on everything around you. So rather than thinking about what's going on in your head, you might focus on flowers or or how you actually physically feel when you're running, you know, things like that. Or, you know, personally, if it's a windy day and it's it can either annoy you or you can t- kind of take strength from that and imagine that you're kind of getting energy from the wind that helps you to run better. So I drew on a lot of what I'd learned in my training during those particular periods. Physically, it was challenging because I think having the balance issues that I do and having like lorries passing past one side of you incredibly fast can kind of throw you off a little bit. So that was that was a challenge. But again, it's something that as the days went on, I kind of adapted to a little bit. The tinnitus was a, a massive issue because I find it's louder anyway. It's totally screwed my musical interests. But, you know, the road noise was so loud that my tinnitus was almost in competition with it. So it would kind of crank up the volume. And if I couldn't shut it out, it became quite unbearable I had my headphones on I had you know really long playlists that I would listen to every day um they were bone conduction headphones so you know there's no no panic about not hearing something around me but it was just a distraction from the noise that like my brain creates that was a challenge fatigue is the other element that I have I became aware as each day kind of went on 
there were periods of time through the day when the fatigue I knew was going to hit really hard. And it, as I discovered, like, you know, later in that journey, which we'll come to in, in a little bit, I'm sure, it always seemed to be around two o'clock in the afternoon. I'd hit a point where I just couldn't even speak to people. I was so tired. I just focused on basic functions and it eventually got to a point where I'd get into the camper van and just sit down and I'd just shut off totally and I couldn't I couldn't stay awake I couldn't fight it anymore and I'd have to have a bit of a a nap in the afternoons. What happened on day five? Oh (laughs) well so day three went okay oh actually no I'll take that back one so day two we had all this torrential rain my feet were wrecked I had quite a traumatic toenail incident which I won't get too graphic about but it involved a rather soggy blister plaster which has absorbed lots of moisture from not only the blister that I had but from my shoes also and it got to a point where I just needed to cut it off and replace it unfortunately as I was cutting it off and pulling it away it actually ripped out my toenail oh. the nail bed and everything it was not pleasant I think we called it operation toe meat so the place that we were staying at we were on a campsite and the guy that ran this place actually and quite bizarrely his nephew had just had surgery for a brain tumor but he allowed us to use his kitchen you know so we had a bit more space it looked like a field hospital a kid you know it was just plasters everywhere I had sterile needles for draining blisters it was awful but I managed to sort my feet out but actually at that point I'd called um, a medic friend of mine Gwyn and he I said I'll spare you the images I said but what's the best way of treating this toe issue? And he said, send me the pictures. I was like, no, 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 it's fine. I'll I'll deal with it. Just let me know what I need to do. And he said, no, send me the pictures. So I did. And he advised me on day two that I should stop. He said that the challenge would always be there and just to, to stop now, heal and go back to it. But I'd put so much effort into like the sponsorship and the planning. And I was like, no, I am not giving up after two days. So I dressed it as best I could um, with his advice and carried on. Um, Day three was tiring. The toes actually weren't so much an issue once I got moving, surprisingly. And that was a good day. I met with Joe Pavey at the end of day three, which was a little boost um, because Joe had been really quite supportive in the build up to this and there were a couple of runners from running at 40 plus who came to join me as well so that was really really nice but I was struggling with a bit of a problem I think with my hip flexor my right hip flexor on the Wednesday I carried on the Wednesday night was a bit miserable really we were on a not a great campsite we had some you know I think there was some lads next to us that were having a bit of a party so I didn't sleep well it rained all night you know it was the ground was sodden the facilities were extremely basic. And so, yeah, I didn't wake up in, a, in the best of moods on the Thursday. Later on, on the Thursday, I think I'd got to around Taunton area and I was met by Adam Holland, who's another endurance athlete who's got quite a, a record of achievements under his belt. You know, go Google him because he's amazing. I didn't know him from Adam. I was quite embarrassed actually, but I came away, you know, when you you meet somebody and you think there's a bit more to you than you're letting on, you know. So I Googled him and um, yeah, he's he's absolutely incredible. And I carried on and I was falling behind with the planned distances I was meant to be doing by the end of the Thursday. And so John made the call that we were going to stop, I think, seven miles short of where I'd planned to for that day. And I, I wasn't happy at all about that decision because the Friday was a shorter day. So that's what had kept me going psychologically. I had a shorter day on the Friday and that was all going to be great. And then it would give me a bit longer recovery time and I could crack on again on the Saturday. So that was kind of taken away from me. But I totally understand, you know, why you made that call because my balance is not great in the dark. We were losing light and it, it just wasn't ideal. Earlier on the Thursday, I started to develop a pain in my left shin and it was progressively getting worse. I'd spoken to my physio earlier that day and, you know, she advised me how I could tape it up and manage it myself so that I could keep going and said, you know, just be really careful because if it's the lower third of your shin, I was like, you know, it'll be fine. Don't worry. I'll just stick some tape on it and keep going. And that's what I did. But then by the the Thursday 
evening i was in absolute agony with it i just took a load of ibuprofen and paracetamol and put ibuprofen gel on it and sprayed freeze gel and anything i had that i thought would help i I took and it didn't really work I, i barely slept that night and the following morning we got up and john drove me back to the point where i'd finished the previous day and I was then going to run back to that campsite and then we'd, we'd carry on as if it was like a clean slate, you know, start the day as it had been planned. So I did that first seven miles and it was excruciating. I, I had to use my running poles at this point just to sort of offload some of the weight from that shin. Again, we had more torrential rain, which just anything like K-tape just washed off. It was awful. So I, I got back to the campsite absolutely drenched, freezing cold. And I was just changing my socks and, and stuff. I noticed that where this pain was in my shin had now become like this swollen, ready, purpley mass and it did not look good. John clocked this and wasn't happy with it. He said, oh, have you bumped into anything? I was like, no, I haven't knocked it at any point. It's just, you know, obviously, I think we we realised then obviously something inside wasn't happy and and it was working its way out so he spoke to a paramedic friend of his who had a look at it on a video call and said no you need to go straight to hospital because potentially it could be something like compartment syndrome keris drove us to the the nearest hospital we could find and we stopped all the watches thinking right we won't be long because it's a friday morning we're in the middle of nowhere it's not going to be busy unfortunately it was it was rammed in a and e that morning the computers were down it was a bit of a nightmare um so long story short i was eventually seen and i came away from from that trip to a and e with my foot in a boot and the understanding that maybe running 40 miles on a suspected stress fracture acute tendonitis and shin splints wasn't my greatest idea oh it must have just been heartbreaking having that boot on i can like yeah being you're yeah, having a boot put on your on your foot on your leg and the realization that actually your dream your goal is is over you you're not going to be able to continue on now. You're not going to be going after the world record attempt. You're not going to be reaching John O'Groats. You're going to be heading home to recuperate and, and recover. You, mentally, how was that time for you? And how did you, you deal with that disappointment? Um, that period of time was incredibly difficult. We got back to the van and headed home. And, you know, within about five minutes of leaving the hospital car park, I'd received a phone call from Martin Hopkinson, who was the founder of Running at 40 Plus, and he'd been my main sponsor. He was asking, you know, how's it going? And and, he was really excited about it because he'd actually come down to Land's End to live stream the start for the club members, having to say to him, actually, it's over. It was awful. Uh, I couldn't speak, actually. I was really upset. So I, I just said, you know, I'll call you later. But I was absolutely devastated because so much effort had gone into this. And I felt like I'd let so many people down. It was just unbelievable. And then it's not like I'd stopped and I could restart at any point. I knew that I had that whole rehab period ahead of me. And anyone that's had an injury like that will know you can't put a timeline on it you you really do not know how that's going to go so we got home on the on the Friday afternoon and that weekend I was just so miserable I was sat looking at boxes of prepared of you know with all my nutrition day to day had been bagged and labeled up individually so I'm sat there looking at all this stuff and thinking about where I should have been that day and I wasn't. My physio, bless her, she had me in first thing on the Monday morning and we had my coach on loudspeaker as well. So she had a good look at everything and she just said, well, actually they both sort of agreed that I needed to treat my rehab as my training because when you're training for something like this it becomes such a huge part of your life and then all of a sudden that's taken away and it wasn't just the fact that that was taken away but for me training is that little bit more it's what keeps me sane it's what keeps getting me up in the mornings because believe it or not even five years after surgery 
there are still days where I could just say, do you know what, I can't do today and just roll over and go back to sleep. But having that training makes me accountable and gets me up every day. So to have that sort of taken away from you in the most horrendous of circumstances was not nice at all. So, yeah, I just had to sort of shift my mindset again then and focus on rehab. I was given a really sort of intensive rehab program, but told that not to get complacent with it and not to kind of forget that I couldn't just finish it and go straight back to running. I'd have to like really build back up to running again. And that was a bit like, oh, okay. It was a bit of a journey in itself. So when did you make the decision that you were going to go for it again? I think it was that first physio appointment because you know I had a chat with Amanda and I said look you know realistically how long do you think it would be before I'm healed enough to to go again and she said well if you're lucky six months so six months would have been the April so I came home and just put April in my diary and that gave me that focus then and everything again just became about working towards getting back to that start line over that time you've got six months to do your rehab which is going to be part of your training program and you're going to get back out there again in 2023 in terms of doing anything differently I suppose what were the lessons maybe that you thought right this is what I need to change this is what I need to adapt you know what changes did you make the real frustrating thing was everything had worked so nutrition worked really well which I was kind of concerned about going into it because I follow quite a low carb diet really and a number of people around me had said you can't do something like this low carb but I was kind of quite insistent that I could and I I did and it worked quite well so yeah nutrition had worked hydration had worked the training effectively had worked and I felt good going into it so There was nothing really that was highlighted that I particularly wanted to change from that aspect. But things like taking, in fact, I invested in a shoe dryer and that came along with us because obviously, you know, that first attempt, I had about five pairs of running shoes. They were all drenched after two days and we had no real way of getting them properly dry. So that contributed, I think, to some of the issues that I had. We kept the logistics of everything exactly the same. So meeting up every five miles was good and it worked. It made it doable. And if I was having a bad day, a mile into a five mile slog, you know, you're going to see somebody within an hour. So that was really good. There wasn't an awful lot that I changed drastically. It's one of those, isn't it? If it's not broken, don't fix it. The only issue that I'd had was with the injury I was conscious of that happening again because people often say, don't they, oh, you know, that's happened once, you're going to be more prone to it in the future. And I was really quite worried about that, you know, and these little things sort of chip away at you, don't they? So I worked really hard on rehab to make sure that that wasn't a problem. I had some advice from Becky Lynn. So she's a former runner and she set up her own business, Graceful Running. So she supported me a little bit in terms of strength and conditioning work that I could do in addition to the training I was already doing just to kind of strengthen those parts that I thought might be a problem. It was just little little tweaks here and there, but nothing major because everything had been going to plan bar the injury. Attempt number two, how did you feel starting again, like getting out there? I love it when you sort of dropped in, you know, the daily mileage. Yeah, you know, the short days are like 37 miles. The long days are like 45 miles. Let's not forget these are big distances that you're doing. So take two, 2023, talk us through it. How did it go? How are you feeling? What happened? What were some of the highlights and the challenges? Okay, so I think I started getting back into running again by about mid-November 2022. I set myself a challenge of a half marathon in January. So it was a trail half marathon it was very cold very wet very muddy but it was good it was a good test of like my shin and everything just to check everything was working as it should be and that there were no issues so that gave me a bit more confidence going into the second attempt I did pick up a a bit of a niggle around February I think 2023 and it was just like a little pain in my shin. And, you know, I've been to physio, couldn't find anything physically wrong with it. And then you start thinking, maybe I'm just imagining this. I'd been diagnosed with an iron deficiency as well in the January, which wasn't ideal. My energy levels had 
they're not great to start with, but they've taken a real plummet by the start of the year. So going into the second attempt, I didn't feel in quite a good a place as I did the first time round. But I was so invested in it. I just thought, I've got to get it done. I am going to cover that distance, whether it kills me or not, because I just wanted it done. I'd, I hate leaving things unfinished. I'm not that kind of person. That box needed to be ticked. So I decided that I had nothing to prove by going back to Land's End and starting from scratch. I'd done that distance. No one could take that away from me. You know, I'd done 160 miles. I think 40 of it I'd done with completely knackered leg. So I wasn't prepared to do another four days of running with lorries on the A30. We headed back to Highbridge, which is where I'd had to stop, not far from Western Supermare. And I headed down this time with a friend of mine, Kerry, who's also has a brain tumour. She was driving and, you know, supporting for me, which was a lot for one person, actually. But, you know, asking people to commit to like two weeks or more, you know, to support you, it, I understand is, is a huge deal. Kerry, thankfully, was able to, to step in and help. We set off. Oh, I was also greased there actually by Simon Graham who'd helped with nutrition and he'd cycled with me on the first day during the first attempt and he, you know he said it seems like tradition that he should be there the second time so he came down and cycled part of the first day with me again which was great just have a bit of company you know for the first few miles while you sort of settle back into it it was good to get back on the road but you know I, I did have a few more concerns that physically about how I would do second time around because I'd found train you know built that training build up the second time much harder and was feeling a little bit broken at times by it you know and obviously that's a worry and I think you just have to kind of shut that out of your mind and just sort of focus on like your you know I call it your three foot world that's all you can influence isn't it in your life so just focus on what was immediately in front of me rather than thinking days ahead I did have concerns about hitting day four because that's where it had all gone wrong the first time round. So psychologically, that was playing on my mind. And it was the longest day overall. I think it was 47 miles. But at the end of that day, I'd arranged to meet my family. So that kind of kept me going. But bizarrely, it was one day where I had no support. And it's almost like I just had to go through the motions of that day on my own and get past that because it, it had played on my mind quite considerably. Yeah, so, it, you know, just to get back on the road was good. Talk us through the last couple of days, the last day, you know, what were you feeling? You know, what was what was going through your mind? So at this point, I must mention, there were a few people that had come out to run with me during the second attempt. Two of those were Paul Betteridge and Amy Tippins. So they're members of Running at 40 Plus, And they'd come out to join me in Hereford. I think it was around Hereford area and yeah they'd come out initially to join me from like I think they planned on doing five miles or so with me that day and ended up staying and doing about 15 which was amazing I don't think it was quite what they expected I think they were expecting a, a nice pleasant trail run not major a roads which is quite amusing and we had horrendous weather as well but they stood the test and they enjoyed it so much that they called back a couple of days later and said actually we're going to come up and join you in Scotland which is awesome Another friend of mine, Andrew Reed. So Andrew has the same or had the same brain tumour as me. He had surgery about a year before. And that's how we became connected through the British Acoustic Neuroma Association. He came out to join me in Lancaster for a day and also enjoyed it so much that he planned to come back and do uh, more mileage with me up in Scotland. So he I think he came and spent the last five days with us. We were also joined by Kerry's sister, Karen. That was amazing that uh, Kerry had some company as well because I think she she was getting cabin fever towards the end of the trip. We had some great days of running through the Cairngorms with Paul and Amy. The weather, actually. I think the day they arrived, it was quite mixed. One minute it was sunny, next minute it was cloudy, raining, hailing, headwinds. wasn't pleasant, but, you know, we got through the Cairngorms. And then as we progressed up the A9, I had Andrew for company, which was great. Especially at this point, it was good to sort of have someone else around that's kind of an extra pair of eyes. I would say pair of ears, but he's deaf like me as well. So at least between us, we had two working ears. But yeah, that was good. Um, that was a real boost. 
personally, it was a real challenge. I'd picked up quite a few injuries along the way by this point. So I think by the time I'd reached the Lake District, Shap Hill saw my knees off totally. So beyond that was not pleasant at all. I had to like really take my knees up every day just to sort of keep them supported. I carried free spray with me, which helps momentarily, but obviously it wasn't a fix for it. Then my, it's quite bizarre when you do something like this, you know, you, you find one part of your body hurts, then that pain moves to somewhere else and you completely forget about the first pain that you had. So my knees had been bad for about a week, but then I started to have issues with my Achilles tendon and my right one first had gone quite lumpy and crunchy and it, it didn't feel good to run on at all. So I had that strapped up quite well supported. But the big issue for me was when I had a, a big issue with my left Achilles tendon. And I remember I was with Andrew and we'd kind of run up this hill and we're crossing over. And just as we got about halfway across the road, I had the most horrendous pain in my Achilles tendon that actually sacks. And I just thought, well, I can't probably can't say what I thought at that point, but the air was blue for a moment, let's say. And we got to the other side and I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll just try again and just take a step. And again, it, it just totally seized up. So Andrew called Kerry, brought the van back and did that day. So I just sat in the van, iced it, dosed up on ibuprofen, tried to massage it out a little bit. It was, I think it was the worst pain that I was in the whole time throughout the journey. And the most debilitating break, and that's one thing, but you can kind of keep going. But with your Achilles tender, when you're trying to run and it just keeps screaming at you, you're not going to go anywhere. I spent a lot of time with running poles the last few days. We'd also taken my bike as a backup plan because I was absolutely determined that whatever happened, I was going to get to John O'Groats. So the following day, I did a few miles on my bike, kind of like an active recovery, just to try and <laughs> get the mileage in but without putting pressure on, on that tendon. I was devastated that I couldn't finish it the way that I wanted to. And so by the time I got to John O'Groats, I think that last day, it was quite a party atmosphere actually going on in the camper van. But as soon as we got out, I was back on the road. I just put my sunglasses on and I cried because I was just in so much pain. Yeah, I just remember seeing the road in towards John O'Groats is one full of potholes and two it just goes on for miles and miles and miles and you've just got fields and sheep either side and lots of nothingness and all I could see ahead was a bit of blue sky but then clouds coming overhead you know when you can kind of see the downpour yeah so that was the final hour or so actually get into the finish at John O'Groats was an immense relief Congratulations on getting to the finish. I mean, a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement. Has it sunk in now, like what you've done, what you've achieved? I was disappointed that I'd not, not like had a sprint finish, you know, because you kind of visualise how these things are going to go, don't you? And I thought, yes, I'm going to get there, I'm going to be strong and all the rest of it. And it wasn't like that at all. But I was relieved to have got there. But yeah, then coming away from that, I remember not long afterwards, standing there and thinking, what do I do now? I was going, that's it, it's done. What now? You know, and it, I felt quite sort of bereft in a way. Yeah, it was very surreal. Did you have the Adventure Blues afterwards? Very much so. I got home, you know, I had months of planning had gone into this. And it's not just like the actual physical aspect of it. It was all the fundraising I've been trying to do and stuff like that. And the raising awareness of what I was doing and why. It was like, what do I do now? It was it was quite bizarre because I couldn't remember a time where I'd not had this to think about. So, yeah, I very much did have the adventure blues. I wasn't a great person to be around probably for a couple of weeks. Initially, I was quite fatigued anyway, so it was a kind of relief to not have anything to do. Yeah. And it's quite bizarre looking on my training schedule and having like three weeks of nothing, which I thought this is going to send me do lally. But actually, I, I, like John said, you've not just run a marathon, you've run. <laughs> run a bit further than that you need to give your body a rest it was quite weird and then actually getting back into running afterwards was quite strange as well because I don't know I love running but I kind of hated it after that you know so that was quite strange as, as well one of the projects that you're working on at the moment is called beyond recovery and I would love for you to share more about beyond recovery what its goals are what your mission is with it and what you're hoping to achieve 
So just to, to go back, I had my surgery in 2018 and in 2019, I was given the opportunity by a friend to take part in a trip to the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, which was amazing. I had my doubts about doing it because there were so many unknowns still there after my surgery and the fatigue was still completely unpredictable. I was still struggling to come to terms with hearing loss and and I've got issues with double vision and things like that. It was something I'd really wanted to do for a long time. Then this had happened and I thought there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do anything like that. So there was a lot of doubt there, I think, really. But as it was, you know, I, I went ahead and I, I, I did the trip. And it was, you know, it was a struggle to get up there, I wouldn't lie. But to stand on the summit of a mountain that you never thought you'd see. I mean, at one point, I thought I'd never even be able to walk to the shops on my own again, you know. So to be actually stood on, on that summit was just incredible. And it was, for me, quite an empowering experience because it raised the bar so much higher for me uh, in terms of what I knew I could then go on to achieve. And yeah, so that was the start of it. And from that moment, really, I thought, you know what, more people need to be doing things like this just to prove to themselves that they are still able to do stuff after going through, you know, a diagnosis like a brain tumour. So this idea had been floating around in my head for some time that I'd go back one day and take a group of brain tumours and then fast forward to my adventure blues and I lost my way for quite a bit actually I I started running again and I, I kind of wanted to love it but I didn't and getting out of the door was a real struggle in fact wanted to do anything was a bit of a struggle to be honest I was back at work so that was you know like you're trying to throw normal life back in the mix again and and it was really difficult and then at the start of July 2023 we went to stay in Morzine in the French Alps and this one particular day we'd taken a drive out to do a bit of a hike in an area that I'd not been to before and at one point you're not sure of the trail <laughs> and we ended up what should have been a path ended up as like quite an exposed ledge and I remember I think I've got a photo somewhere actually just hanging onto this <laughs> this ledge and thinking wow you know I wasn't scared at all but I just thought this this is the buzz that I need to get back in my life I think it was probably that moment I just thought I need more mountains in my life. You know, forget the tarmac, forget the roads and just do stuff like this. So I decided pretty much there and then that when I got back home, instead of talking about this idea that I'd had, I was just going to go ahead, speak to people, put a date on it and make it happen. Because I think so often that we have ideas of goals that we want to achieve, but that's all they stay as is like this idea that floats around. And yeah, for me, just to put a date on it made it definite. Like, you know, just like Land's End to John O'Groats, if I set my mind to do something, I will do it. And if I've got a date on something, it's going to happen. So I spoke to a couple of people and set a date for June 2024 when I would take a group of people out with me to Morocco. I posted about it online and within days, I had a group of about, I think, five or six people that were going to come along with me. That was the start of it. And since then, it's kind of snowballed into something quite incredible. So I've actually set up the Beyond Recovery Project now as a community interest company. So it's a non-profit organisation. And we're currently fundraising to cover the cost of this challenge. But as you know, we've come to realise from speaking to some members of this team and members of the wider brain tumour community that there is such a lack of support post treatment recovery is a really difficult place to be one minute you've got this tumor it's got to come out we have to do this to save your life but it's going to leave you with life changing side effects and then the next minute it's like right you know it's gone now you're recovered off you go but that period does not come with a guidebook that explains how you're going to feel, how you're going to overcome the different issues along the way. And there are support groups out there which are great for the majority of people, but I think there are also a lot of people out there who don't sort of feel comfortable in that sort of environment of sitting down and chatting and would much rather be out there, you know, being phys actually physically working on their recovery rather than talking it through. That's kind of how I felt 
going through my own journey and it was good in a way to feel that I wasn't alone in that but also it's quite sad when you look out there and you think well actually who does help you with with wanting to do that and I personally didn't know of anywhere where I could get that kind of support so I kind of decided to put that in place myself so that's what we're doing we're going um, the aim is that we have like big challenges like but we also have challenges close to home and days where we'll go out for walks and we can talk with other people who have been on the same journey well we have actually got a couple of talking therapists or talking counsellors who are prepared to come out and support those events as well is great because obviously then people are getting access to the support they might not be able to access through the NHS. It's highlighted a lot of need within the brain tumour recovery community. So I'm hoping that we can, you know, with a bit of awareness that we can then fill some of those gaps in services. This is fantastic what you're doing. Do you know what I really love is the fact that you had this dream, you had this idea, and you didn't just think about it. You actually went out and took action to make it happen, which is so, so powerful. And now you've got the Beyond Recovery Recovery Project, which is um, a CIC, which is a, what's that sound for? A community? Community interest company. Community interest company, which is absolutely fantastic. And Sarah, how can people connect with you? How can they find out more information about the Beyond Recovery Project? Where are you most active on the socials I do a lot of speaking and I've you know as I discussed in the previous podcast I've written a book called Sick Bed to Summit so you can find out more about me and the book on my website which is www.sarahcrossland that's s-a-r-a-c-r-o-s-l-a-n-d.com and there's links on there to my social media also the Beyond Recovery Project has its own website now and again links to social media and that's www.thebeyondrecoveryproject.org. Sarah, I would love for you to have the final words of advice, final words of wisdom for other women out there who want to take on different challenges and get outside and pursue their dreams and their ambitions. Apart from just do it, what advice would you like to share? And you can take that in any direction, whether it's practical, logistical, um, yeah, any any direction that you would like. So like having a, a goal or, you know, an idea of something you want to do can sometimes seem quite overwhelming. I used to look at like polar explorers and think, wow, that's just incredible, but that's not for me because I could never do something like that. Land's End to John O'Groats, you know, that's what elite athletes did. I would never do anything like that. But you can, kind of have to step back from that place and set yourself that goal in the future but then would think about all those little things that you need to put in place in order to achieve that goal so set yourself lots of little incremental goals along the way and that can be things like working on your physical fitness or your nutrition and also things like finding people who will support you I think through finding my coach John has opened my eyes to a whole other world of adventure and endurance that I didn't even know existed and all these incredible people, many of whom have supported me throughout the challenges I've taken on. And it's great to be part of that community. So go out there, research what it is you want to do, the people that do it, people that can support you, because that sort of endurance adventure environment is incredibly supportive. No one's ever going to laugh at you or turn you away if you ask them for advice. And I used to think, also that hanging out with people that were better at than me, I couldn't do it because it makes you feel quite sort of vulnerable when you put yourself out there. But it's great to get out with people that know more than you because they have so much knowledge to pass on and you learn so much from them and evidence boost as well. And they're also really encouraging. So get out there, set yourself little incremental goals that get you to your big goal and find people to help you along the way. Absolutely. Find people to help you along the way. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more about your journey and your story. It's been absolutely inspiring and best of luck with the Beyond Recovery Project. It is incredible work that you are doing. Thanks for having me. Hey Tribe, I really hope you enjoyed the episode with Sarah. What an absolute inspiration. And what's really cool is Sarah actually doesn't live too far away from me. So she, so after we recorded the episode, we were just like chatting away. 
And it was like, oh, you know, what are you up to? Did she tell me she was running this, you know, marathon? And I was like, oh, would you fancy, you know, coming for, uh, coming for a walk with me? Come to my, come to my house, come to Hoy Lake, and we can go for a nice little beach walk, a little bit of a training walk for me, and a little bit of um, a recovery for Sarah after her after her marathon. So she came over, joined me. We did a nice little five mile walk, both of us carrying packs, and uh, yeah, came home. And I cooked a lovely meal for us, which was really fabulous. So it's always great when you get to meet guests like face to face and just carry on the conversation and continue, you know, learning more about them and the different challenges and the work that they are doing. You know, obviously during during this conversation when we were speaking to Sarah, we talked a lot about Land's End to John O'Groats, that being an incredible challenge and that being an incredible goal. And we've actually spoken to a quite a few jog runners and cyclists throughout the years. So I'm just going to give you a couple of names of podcast episodes which might be of interest, especially if you're interested in the Land's End to John O'Groats challenge. So on the 16th of December 2021, we spoke with Marcia Roberts. She was the first woman to record an official time for cycling 1,725 miles from La Jog and back. 4th of August 2019, we spoke with Mel Nichols. She's a Paralympian endurance and adventure athlete, and she is also the hand cycle La Jog world record holder. The 14th of March, we spoke with 14th of March 2023, we spoke with Ali Bailey, phenomenal runner, phenomenal ultra runner, and she shared more about her journey of running over a thousand miles from Land's End to John O'Groats in 35 days. And on the 1st of September 2020, we spoke with Carla Molinaire. M-O-L-I-N-A-R-O. She's an elite ultra runner who broke the woman's record from Land's End to John O'Groats. And during that episode, Carla shares more about her passion for running and goes into detail about the training, planning and preparation for her challenge of running the length of Great Britain, which she did in a record-breaking time of 12 days, 30 minutes and 14 seconds. Now, the key thing to remember on this is no comparisons allowed. Every person is different. The challenge may be the same, but you know, different people, different times of year, different challenges, different experience. It doesn't make it better or worse. It just makes it different. And it it is what it is. But you can 100% learn something from each of the women who have shared their stories about this particular challenge. And maybe it will inspire you to think about your next challenge. And randomly at the beginning of this year, the beginning of 2023, I was actually thinking about doing a similar challenge, but I was going to call it Sarah Goes to the Shetlands. And what I was going to do is I was going to start the Southwest Coast Path and then sort of walk along and I'll be walking, hiking, uh, walk to Land's End and then head up to head up to John O'Groats. But I would do that via the Southwest Coastal Path, getting to Bristol, doing Offers Dyke, <coughs> excuse me, cross over to the Pennine Way and then head on to the Scottish National Trail, which also includes Cape Wrath and then do the North Highland Way and then up to the Shetlands Island. And to be honest, I've actually got it sort of quite well planned out in in my Apple notes on my phone. And I was actually seriously considering it, but you know, the time frame got in the way, life got in the way, I wasn't really able to move forward with it. And other opportunities became available for me in 2023, which you've probably seen. But if you want, if you are interested in learning more about what my 2023 has looked like, I did actually release a solo catch up episode on the 10th of September, which does share more information about me, the different challenges, what I've been up to. And on the 2nd of November, I released another solo episode. And this time it's focusing on my New Zealand hike, hiking the Tiararoa Trail, which is what I'm currently walking at the moment. So at this point, like I mentioned in my previous episode, I should be very, very close to Wellington in the North Island, which is the south southern part. Part of the North Island and hopefully you've been following along with the journey on Instagram at Tough Girl Challenges send me a DM if you're following along but more information about my New Zealand hike can be found on the website toughgirlchallenges.com challenges being sponsored by Zolio hashtag challenge with Zolio and I'm sharing daily on my social media plus filming the challenge to be shared on YouTube at a future date. At this point in time, I don't know when I'm going to have time to edit it, but at least I will have all of this footage to be able to share with you the realities of being out there day after day, walking this incredible trail, 3,000 kilometers, which I'm absolutely loving. Thank you so much for listening to the Tough Girl podcast. I hope it is inspiring you to think about your next challenges, especially for 2024. Everything that we have shared today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. You can support the work that I do by signing up as a patron, visiting Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash tough girl podcast. You can also make a one off donation via PayPal. All donations are very much appreciated. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it, believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. <laughs>